where one of my friends in the choir learned about the subject of my presentation today, he remarked, oh, so that means you're going to discuss those nutty transcendentalists. <laughs> I'm going to keep him incognito because he was once my friend. <laughs> but his sentiment may well represent a commonly held perception. Transcendentalists tended to write and speak a romanticized public poetic language even when they were writing expository prose. They can be writing a sentence that makes a perfectly good sense to the modern reader, and suddenly the wording veers off to metaphors that challenge the reader to dig deeply to find meaning or to skip the sentence altogether. <laughs> For example, in Nature, Edison's first book, he uses the unique but strange image of a transparent eyeball. <laughs> now, my students have said, what on earth is he talking about? But happily, he actually tells us, before that image was drawn by Christopher Church, between the years 1836 and 38, Emerson had told his readers what that image <coughs> meant. He said the writing at the bottom of the page was actually that belonging to Emerson, even though it was written there, and that's his handwriting by Christopher Crunch. And it's an image in Emerson's way of saying that in nature, he finds himself diminished in size and scope and importance in comparison with the vastness of creation. Hence, while standing on bare ground, uplifted into infinite space, all mean egotism vanishes. And there's even a coloring book version of the eyeball. <laughs> well, yes, Emerson was one of these transcendental thinkers and writers. And what is a transcendentalist? Well, the standard definition is the transcendentalist based reality on spiritual intuition. Or as it's sometimes said, the transcendentalist saw a little farther. Emerson is a leader in that school of thought, and he is a leader in the development of Unitarianism. He does not figure into our Universalist side, even though Universalism was well recognized as a liberal religion in its own right. One thing among many things that we can take from Emerson's journals is that he revealed something universal during his youth. It was what we today refer to as uh, finding oneself. As a young man, he had little inward direction other than to get the best education possible. He did not trust his own intelligence to take him in a good direction. He distrusted himself. At age 17, he wrote in his journals, I find myself often idle, vagrant, stupid, and hollow. I am indolent and shall be insignificant. I need excitement. But that was Emerson, not me. 
And when he was 20, he journaled, the dreams of my childhood are all fading away and giving place to some very sober and very disgusting views of a quiet mediocrity and condition. But I do not want to spend the rest of the morning on such biography. More to the point is Emerson's relationship to the call to ministry. In 1824, he had made a correction in his thinking. On April 17 of that year, he wrote in his journal, I'm beginning my professional studies. In a month, I shall be legally a man, and I deliberately dedicate my time, my talents, my hopes to the church. He had, he thought, found where he could exercise moral imagination. That is, his sense of right and wrong. He could not go through a reasoned, intellectual process to determine those values. But he was convinced of the beauty, the spiritual essence of values that guide human behavior. Now to get there, he wanted to be, quote, the perfect model of a Christian man. He thought that ministry involved two expectations. The first was public preaching. The second, having an influence on individual congregants in private discussion. But he also realized he did not have what he calls a warm heart. But now and again, he reverted to his old self-inflicted sense of inadequacy and mediocrity. Even after affirming his future in Unitarianism, he said, I cannot accurately estimate my chances of success in my profession and in life. Were it just to judge the future from the past, my chances would be very low. Well, this is where Emerson was in his early years. He had not felt he was an adequate school teacher, though he tried that profession. And in spite of his passion for doing good work in ministry, even that was in question. Well, sure enough, when he completed his Harvard studies in divinity, he accepted the call to ministry only to reside in the pulpit a little less than three years. And why did he resign? Because he said he could no longer, in good faith, participate in leading the Holy Communion of bread and wine, symbols of the body and blood of Christ. Such was his official reason. That was it for leaving the ministry. But the chancel was not really the stage he wanted. He wanted a larger area or influence wherein his acknowledged lack of personal warmth would be no deterrent to success. Again, I dip into Emerson's journals, a, an abbreviated copy of which I have here. There are actually seven volumes of Emerson's journals. He started writing when he was a teenager and he continued until about eight years before he died. Those 11 volumes were edited by his son, and his grandson. So I dip into Emerson's journals for some comments dated in 1831. This one is June 20, 1831. 
is an early hint of a concern about the future of that still young religion, Unitarianism. The journal paragraph points the way to several ideas he will later develop in more depth. I suppose, he writes, it is not wise to belong to any religious party. In the Bible, you are not directed to be a Unitarian, a Calvinist, or a Episcopalian. Now, the man be wise. He will say to himself, I'm not a member of that or any party. I am God's child, a disciple of Christ, or in the eyes of God, a fellow disciple in Christ. A sect or part is an elegant incognito devised to save a man from the vexation of thinking. Now, of course, since my roots are here in this church, I take exception to those sentiments, but this is about Emerson, not about him. <laughs> With ministry behind him, he left New England for an 11-month tour of Europe. He visited Sicily, Naples, Rome, Florence, Venice, then crossed the Alps. He stayed in Switzerland, Paris, London, the English Lake Country, and Southern Scotland. He met such men as Landor, Coleridge, Wordsworth, Carlyle. And several of his journal entries center on these places and these people. And one story about seeing the Pope in Rome will probably not surprise them. After all, his professional Protestant background gave him a particular frame in which to view his holiness. So this is from the journal. I have been to the Sistine Chapel to see the Pope bless the palms and hear his choir chant the Passion. The cardinals came in one after another, each wearing a purple robe and urban cape and a small red cap to cover the tonsil. A priest attended each one to adjust to the robes of their eminences. As each cardinal entered the chapel, the rest rose. One or two were fine persons. These came, then came the Pope in scarlet robes and bishops mitre. After he was seated, the cardinals went in turn to the throne and kneeled and kissed his hand. After this ceremony, the attendants divested the cardinals of their robes and put on them in gorgeous capes of cloth of gold. There was much etiquette. Some kissing the hand only, some the foot also of the Pope. You know, it was hard to recognize in this ceremony the gentle son of man. Who sat upon an ass. amidst the rejoicings of his fickle countrymen. All of this pomp is conventional. It is imposing to those who know the customs of courts and of what wealth and of what rank these particular forms are the symbols, but to the eye of an Indian, I'm afraid it would be ridiculous. There is no true majesty in all this 
millinery and imbecility. <laughs> Later, as time slipped away, and he had the journey home to Massachusetts before him, he reflected on the notables he had met. The comfort of meeting men of genius, he writes, men of genius, such as these, that is the ones I have named, is that they talk sincerely. They feel themselves to be so rich that they are above meanness of pretending to knowledge they do not have. And now we come to the Divinity School Address with one small preparatory note from the journals. In an entry dated 1838, the year of the address, Emerson makes this comment. The belief in Christianity that now prevails is the unbelief of men. They will have Christ for a Lord and not a brother. Christ preaches the greatness of man, but from pulpits we hear only the greatness of Christ. That difference between Lord and brother was much in his thinking as he wrote the address. It was not the faculty of the Divinity School that asked Emerson to speak at the commencement ceremony for the graduating students who were about to go out into the big wide world and lead congregations. The students, the students themselves, made it their progress to invite Emerson to their ceremony. It was a small gathering. The class consisted of only seven students, six of whom actually attended the lecture. In addition, attendance included the professors, of course, and the families of the students, whereas Emerson had lectured to as many as 500 people at this point in his career. Here were 50. His address was received as an attack on liberal Protestantism as it was then known. What Emerson feared most about Unitarianism is that it might become just another Protestant denomination professing second-hand truths from the pulpit. Unitarianism had become a recognized religion in this country only 13 years before he delivered the Divinity School Address. So it was as new as new could be. One student of Emerson writes that Emerson wanted no more second-hand God, even on the best authority. He professed reverence unfeigned for Jesus, but denied the perfection of Jesus. In Emerson's thinking, Jesus was Jesus because he refused to listen to the rabbis in his own time and listened at home. Emerson could not believe in a personal God or a God represented in images of personality or a God of personification. A personified God was beyond his belief system. If that is the case, did he continue in religion and to be considered religious? Well, yes, if we take religion out of hearsay documents and place belief in the bosom of each person. And what does this come down to? It is the conviction that divinity is within, between, and among. It is a conviction that speaks to 
a passage in Luke 17, verse 21. The Pharisee asked, where is the kingdom of God? Where is the kingdom of God? And Emerson tells us, as the Bible tells us, that it is within. That is Emerson's ultimate heresy. It is to accept the premise that the kingdom of God is inside you, and that is not, it's not going to be announced by the music of trumpets and fanfares, it's going on our angels descending. That heresy of direct revelation, the heresy of divinity within, between, and among is the reason Harvard professors agreed that years would pass before Emerson would ever again be invited to speak to divinity students. <laughs> Do we have room for Emerson's heresy itself? Could it be that he touched upon a religious idea that is meaningful to 21st century Unitarians? That, my friends, is the open-ended question.